All right. I want to give you a real, real important, and it could be a very short lesson today. I say it's real, real important because to me it is, as I shared with you last week, your lifeline. The lifeline is when you're on the bathroom floor, floor like Jeff just talked about, because you burn all your bridges, your life is falling apart, you're so screwed up you don't know which way is up, and you need help. Whatever helps you, that's your lifeline. The lifeline we've identified that Paul's talking about in Romans chapter 8 is none other than the Spirit of God. That's your lifeline. Thank you, Lord, for that rain. I appreciate that. Now, some of you may be flooded. I realize that. And, but we around here has been a little dry, so we need a little rain. You no, know, you guys need to cover your stuff here real quick, all right? The lifeline I'm talking about is described in the Bible as in various metaphors, but one probably the most important is actually water. Jesus called it living water or life-giving water. You remember when he interviewed the woman at the well? She wasn't on the bathroom floor, but she was out in the midday drawing water, which meant that she was an outcast of the village. She was an outcast because of her lifestyle. Her lifestyle was what we might call questionable at best. She was the one with seven husbands. Remember that? And the guy she was living with wasn't her husband. <laughs> she had an all too familiar kind of lifestyle for unfortunately a lot of women. And that lifestyle led her to be shunned from the village. She couldn't gather with the other women to gather water early in the morning. She had to come out when nobody else was around. Her bathroom floor was gathering water at midday. Well, Jesus just happened to show up there and he started talking to her, which was kind of strange that him being a Jew and a man at that would ever even talk to her. She thought it was weird. She didn't know what he had in mind. And so she kind of tested him a little bit when he asked her for some water. There at Jacob's well, and he said, give me a drink. And that kind of shocked her. And in the course of their conversation, Jesus said to her, if you knew who I was, who I am, you would ask me for a drink of life-giving water, and I'd give it to you. Now, of course, she didn't understand any of that. And I won't go into the rest of the story. But later at the feast that Jesus attended to announce himself publicly as the Messiah, he told the folks there that whoever believes on me, out of his belly, that's the innermost part of his being. Will flow rivers of living, life-giving water. <laughs> now I want you all to think about this a minute. What Jesus was talking about, John goes on to explain to us in that context. He said, but this he spoke of the Spirit which he was to give all who believe on him. For the Spirit had not yet been given because Jesus had not yet been glorified. 
So people didn't really understand what he meant about out of your belly or the innermost part of you would flow rivers of living water. What Paul has been talking about in Romans chapter 8 is that very thing that Jesus promised. He has been talking about what God through the Spirit does in each of us. He's been talking about out of our innermost being. That's the new person you are that God has made you to be. Created in Christ Jesus. That's your inner man or the innermost being that you are. He says, out of that innermost being will flow rivers of life-giving water. He's talking about the Spirit flowing in and through you out to others. Now, in order to understand the importance of this, we've got to realize who we're talking about here. When I say the Spirit, I'm talking about the Holy Spirit. The third person of the Godhead. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. I'm not talking about some mystical idea that we might have. I'm talking about a person that Jesus promised each of you would have. He called him the Comforter. Remember in that context? It was the night before Jesus was crucified. He told his disciples, I'm leaving you. And where I'm going, you can't come. Now, of course, his disciples were freaked. They lost it all together. They didn't believe him. They actually argued with him. You can't leave. Not now. See, they were well aware of all the controversy he started with the, those people in power. They knew their name was on the blacklist just for hanging out with him. He said, I'm leaving you. And they freaked. In addition, they were counting on the fact, following for three years, they were counting on the fact that he was going to set up his kingdom. Because they believed he was a king. And he thought they thought he was going to set up his kingdom right then and there, and they were going to be rich and famous. They would be respected. They would be honored. Because they were with the king. Jesus said, I'm leaving you. And they freaked. Just like you and I had freaked. And so to comfort them, to assure them, he gave them this promise. I'm leaving you, but I'm going to give you another comforter. Even the spirit of truth. Whom the world doesn't see, but you know him. He's been with you and he shall be in you. Now understand, this is the same spirit that he spoke of when he said, Out of the innermost being will flow rivers of living water. Life-giving water. It's the same spirit that he was referring to now as the comforter. Now that spirit is the same spirit Paul has talked about in Romans 8 as being the one who raised Jesus from the dead. How many of you realize you can't get more of a bathroom floor than being dead? That's it. You're done. You're dead. That spirit raised Jesus from the dead. 
It's that spirit, he says, that is living in you right now. The only condition upon the spirit living in you is whether or not you believed on Jesus. If you believed on Jesus, the spirit is living in you. Same spirit that Jesus promised. Same exact spirit. No different. But let's carry it one step further. That spirit that's living in you right now is also that spirit that hovered over and brooded over the formless mass in the beginning of the creation. We're talking about the Spirit of God living inside of you. Um, most Christians I've talked to, most believers, have some sense, because of their experience on a personal level, of being, quote, born again or converted or saved, whatever you want to call it, because of the experience they had, which if it was a long time, like it's been for me, I was 11 years old when I was born again, still remember it, but that was a long time ago, I'm an old dude now. And so there's a lot of vagaries associated with what I remember, but if you've believed on Jesus and you've had that experience as a believer and you have the Spirit in him, you've got the sense that the Spirit of God is actually living in you. But that's about all you know about it. And after a while, with time, it gets, it gets down to, well, he's supposed to be living in me. Yeah, the Bible says he lives in me, so I know the Spirit of God is supposed to be living in me, and that's about all you know. Now, Paul anticipates this in Romans chapter 8, when he tells us we are no longer debtors to the flesh to live after the flesh. For if you keep on living naturally after the flesh, you die. You experience all kinds of death. Personal death, social death, relational death, all kinds of death. But if you, through the Spirit, remember that Spirit living in you? You, through the Spirit, put to death the deeds of the body, you should be caused to live by the Spirit. Now what we're trying to figure out is exactly what that means. As I shared with you last week, Paul's talking about it in negative terms when he says, you, through the Spirit, put to death the deeds of the body. And I think he does that because believers have this natural idea that once you're a Christian, you've got to quit. You know what I mean? Somebody along the lines told you, now that you're a Christian, you need to quit one thing or another. Some of those things, by the way, you don't have any problem with. You say, yeah, I need to quit doing that. But some of those things you have a real problem with because you like doing that. But most Christians get the idea that now they're a Christian, they've got to quit doing something. Then those helpful teachers come along and they give you a whole list of things you need to quit doing. In order for you to be a good Christian, you need to knock off all this stuff. You need to quit. Now, because of our natural conditioning, we get the idea that, okay, well, if I know I need to quit, somebody tells me to quit, I'll just tough it out and I'll quit. I'll white knuckle it. I'll, I'll just say no. Remember that drug campaign, just say no? The only problem with that is just say no didn't work. But they're trying to quit. I gotta quit. Here Paul gives us a key to that. He says, if you, through the Spirit, 
quit. Now that's an all important key. As I shared with you last week, it's not you through the Spirit that just quits doing things. Also in Galatians, it's you through the Spirit that does other things. But through the Spirit is the important ingredient. Now quickly, I just gave you a synopsis last time of what your responsibility is and the Spirit's responsibility. Your responsibility always, always, always comes down to one word, and that's faith. That's it. After all, you are a, quote, believer, right? What do believers do? They believe. Faith. That's your job. That's all. Faith. You don't do anything or you don't not do anything. You believe. That's your job. Well, what's God's job? God's job can be crystallized in one word also. His job is power. Resurrection power. His job is to change you from the inside out. His job is to make it happen. Ain't your job to make it happen. It's his job to make it happen. So if your job is to believe, and God's job is to make it happen, whether that's the negative quit or the positive do something else. Then it really comes down to, okay, my job is to believe. What do I need to believe? And this is where people have a tendency to fall apart at this point. Not knowing what to believe they revert back to their old way of, okay, I'm going to do it. I'm going to get it done. See, even though our responsibility is to believe and God's responsibility through the Spirit is power to get it done, we naturally reverse that in our religious thinking. Did you know that? Yeah, we do. We tell God as reverently as we can possibly do so, we tell God, trust me, I'll quit. Trust me, I'll start going to church. And we promise God all these empty promises about what we're going to do. I think God has a sense of humor, especially when I talk to him like that. I think all of heaven laughs. You're going to do what? Well, yeah, God, I promise I'll never do it again. How long does that last? Eh, about a day and a half. Okay, God, from now on I'm going to start. I'm going to start on a diet. How long is that going to last? Huh? So you can't tell God you're going to do anything without causing all of heaven to laugh, because you've got no power. See, when Jesus told his disciples on the same night he promised the Spirit, he told them, without me, you can't do anything. When I first read that, I thought, oh, I know what he's talking about. Without me, I can't be religious. Without him, I can't do religious things. No, 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 no. Without me, you can't do anything means without me, you don't take another breath. Without me, your heart doesn't beat any longer. Without me, you got no control over your own bowels. Without me, you can do nothing. Amen. Now, what he was talking about is give up this self-centered idea that you think you're going to promise God to be good. You ain't going to promise God anything. So our job is to believe. His job is to make it happen. Now, we get confused with that a lot. And so I'm going to cut right to the hard issue of what Paul's talking about here in Romans chapter 8. Because in the next few verses, verses 14 through 16, he's going to counter most of the obstacles we have in believing See, one of the greatest obstacles in believing 
and trusting the Spirit in our lives is the fact that we don't believe naturally that He's leading us. We don't believe God's talking to us. As a matter of fact, in our culture today, if you dare suggest publicly that God talks to you, people think you're crazy. Yeah, they will. They think, what? God talks to you? So, one of the biggest obstacles in following the leadership of the Spirit, following His directions, as Jesus promised, He will lead you, He will guide you into all truth, He will teach you, He will show you things to come, He'll empower you. He'll make me real to you. In believing all that, one of the biggest things we have to overcome with is God doesn't talk to me. You know, he talks to religious people. He talks to the Pope. He talks to Billy Graham, or did talk to Billy Graham. He talks to other people, but me, he don't talk to me. Mm -mm. Never heard his voice. That's a big obstacle. How are you going to receive comfort from the comforter if he doesn't talk to you? How are you going to know what to do if he doesn't talk to you? Well, it's simple. I just fall back on my old natural standby and I Google it. <laughs> Piece of cake. See, a lot of people have trouble hearing God because they don't think he's talking to them. So in verse 14 here, Paul clears the air once and for all. He tells us, right after that call to, for us through the Spirit to put to death the deeds of the body. He says in verse 14, For as many as are led by His Spirit, the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Now that's like a little equation, if you will, in the Bible. It's like 2 plus 2 equals 4. Well, if that's true, then 4 equals 2 plus 2. If you're led by the Spirit, you're child of God. If you're a child of God, you're led by the Spirit. What does that tell you? You're being led by the Spirit constantly. So don't ever use the excuse, I don't hear God. It ain't because He ain't talking. Amen. It's because you ain't listening. And the biggest reason you ain't listening is because you don't think He's talking to you. Now if you don't think somebody's talking to you, you're not going to pay attention. You're not going to hear what they have to say. So what he tells us in verse 14 basically is pay attention. He's talking to you. If you're his child, he is leading you. He is continually talking to you. Ever since I got struck by lightning and lost the hearing in my left ear, it's really hard for me to hear people trying to talk to me. You come up on my left side and you can talking to me, I'm not going to answer you. I'm not even going to hear you. Now, if I know you're trying to talk to me, I'll pay attention. I'll turn around, I'll look, I'll try to read your lips, whatever. But if I don't think you're trying to talk to me, I ain't going to hear you. Period. See, a lot of people don't hear God because they don't think He's talking. Why don't they think He's talking? They don't believe He's talking. If your job is to believe, the very first thing you need to believe is He's talking to you. He is leading you. Pay attention. Then we also have a problem. If God's talking to me through His Spirit. He's leading me, directing me, guiding me. If that's true. And He's actually talking to me all the time. Then our next obstacle that we all encounter is what if he tells me to do something I don't want to do? What if I don't want to hear what he's telling me? That makes me kind of nervous. I remember my last year in cemetery, <laughs> seminary. 
I was considering God talking to me about what I was going to do. And I got this idea, strange idea that God wanted me to be a missionary to the headhunting tribes in the Amazon basin. <laughs> I think I got that idea because I watched a newscast about these missionaries being killed by those tribes. And I thought, up, oh, God's calling me to take their place. That's why I went to school. That's what I'm here for. I got to go to Amazon basin. And I couldn't shake it. I couldn't get that thought out of my mind. Finally, after about a week of it, I broke down and told my wife, Sandy, I think God's calling me to be a missionary in the Amazon Basin. She looked at me and calmly said, I'll write you frequently. Amen. There was no way in hell she was going to the Amazon Basin. So for the next week, I considered going to the Amazon Brazen, divorced. And I mean, I was really struggling with this thing because I thought God was telling me to do something I didn't want to do. Finally, I broke down and prayed about it. <laughs> Asked him. I said, God, do you really want me to go to the Amazon Basin? I mean, if you really want me to go, I'll trust you. I'll go. Immediately, he said, my mind, I don't want you to go to the Amazon Basin. I want you to be willing to do whatever I tell you to do. And that put a whole new spin on it for me. I want you to trust me. I want you to believe in me enough to know that I'll only tell you what to do for your good. I only tell you what's best for you. That was a pretty monumental step in my belief at that point. Because with that comes the fact that God, again as Jeff and the band say, is a good God. He's your heavenly father, not your heavenly judge. You see, most of us kind of approach God kind of fear and trembling and we think, Oh, man, I've screwed up so much, he's going to zap me. And if I dare listen to what he has to say, he's going to condemn me. Go back to verse 1, Romans 8. There is therefore now no condemnation to you who are in Christ. God's not about to condemn you. If you have thoughts of condemnation, that is not God. That is you, your stinking flesh, or somebody else. It's not God. He doesn't condemn you. So we don't have to be afraid of him. That's what Paul's getting down to. And he illustrates that in verse 15 when he says, For we have not, you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. What's the spirit of bondage? The spirit of bondage is when you think you have to. You're in bondage. You have to. When you think you're, you have to, you have the spirit of bondage. Well, God's telling me to do this. I really don't want to, but I got to. Spirit of bondage. That's not God. You have not been given the spirit of bondage again to fear. See, with that spirit of bondage comes fear. Not just fear of what he might tell you to do that you don't want to do, but the fear of failure if he tells you to do something. Even if you want to do it, you ain't sure you can do it. And so you get this spirit of failure. Of fear. That's not God. God does not. I want you guys to hear this. I know it may seem radical to you. But I want you to take it to heart. God does not scare you into obedience. Religion does that. That ain't God. He doesn't threaten you to get you to behave. That's not God. A lot of people will get the idea, well, I better do this or God is going to get me. <laughs> Listen, 
If he wanted to get you, you'd been God already. That's not God. That's your own religious nonsense playing out in your head. It's not God. For you've not been given the spirit of bondage again to fear, but the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, or make word for Daddy, Father. So your relationship to God is not a relationship of a servant to a taskmaster. It's a relationship of a child to his father. Now I know in the first three, three and a half, four years of your life, your concept of who God is is set by the relationship you had with your earthly father. I understand that. But that's not what's revealed in the scriptures. The scriptures reveal a totally different relationship. It reveals the same relationship you have with God right now is the same relationship Jesus had with the Father. That's the relationship you have with God right now. Well, did God hate his son Jesus? No. He loved him. His only begotten son. And so when he says, you've not been given the spirit of bondage again to fear, but the spirit of adoption, he's talking about a brand new kind of relationship you have. You have been adopted by God into his family. He is your adopted father. I studied that extensively to try to figure out why Paul would use the term adoption. He's the only writer that does use the term adoption to describe our relationship. And I found out legally, in the Roman culture, if you had a natural born child, and that natural born child was rebellious in some way or brought shame upon the family, you could disown that natural child. You could, quote, emancipate that natural born child. And by the way, fathers, you might not realize this, because kids naturally rebel during their teenage years, and many of them say, when I'm 18, I'm going to leave this house, and I'm going to do whatever I want to do when I'm 18. That's not the magic number. 18 is not the magic number. Legally, 16 is the magic number, because at 16 years of age, you fathers can emancipate your children. What does that mean? That means you're no longer liable for their welfare. That means they're on their own. That means they can go anywhere and do anything they want to, and you're not held responsible for it at all. Now, in the Roman culture, similar to ours, if a child was acting out and screwing up, you could emancipate them. However, there was one special case. If that child was adopted into your family, no matter what that child did, no matter how grievous it might be to your family, Legally, a father could never emancipate an adopted child, ever. What's Paul trying to tell us here? Part of the spirit of bondage again to fear is that fear of failure. You might screw it up. So you're going to try to listen to God. You're going to try to do what he's telling you to do. You're going to try to hear, at least, what he has for you. And you decide... Okay, God, I'm going to listen to you now. I'm going to shut up. I'm going to be quiet. I'm going to listen to you. Now, you talk to me. All of a sudden, there's that fear of failure that starts building. What if God doesn't say anything? What if he tells me something I don't want to hear? What if he tells me something I can't do? See, that fear starts building. It's that fear, the spirit of bondage again to fear. 
No, he says, you've not been given that. You've been given a spirit of adoption. So what God is going to tell you is the best thing for you. What God is going to say to you is what you need right now. What God is going to lead you to do is the best possible life for you. Why? Because you've not been given the spirit of bondage again to fear. God has never, will never emancipate you. He will never turn you loose. He will always be your father. Even when you screw it up. I like the way that we'll talk more about this later and we'll get into it a little more in depth. But I like the way the Bible describes our responsibility in believing. Remember, our job is faith, his is power. I like the way he describes it as walking in the Spirit. One of the pleasures I had, not only as a father myself, when my daughter was small, but also as a granddaddy. I love kids about this age right here, Kinsey's. And one of the biggest pleasures I had was watching them learn to walk. Ooh, that was fun. Now, when they pull themselves up and they take that first little fledgling step and they let go and they're standing there for a little while and boom, on their butt they go. Squash that diaper. What do we do? Do we condemn them? Oh, man, you screwed up. You only made it a half a step. What's the matter with you? You can't do any better than that? No. What happens when they take that first little fledgling step? The whole household erupts in praise. We clap and applaud and go bananas. They took their first step. That's what heaven does when you take your first step in the spirit, trusting the Father. He doesn't condemn you because you blew it, because you only took a half step and fell on your butt. No, he's rejoicing. He trusted him. See, the spirit of adoption is a spirit of knowing that you're okay regardless of your performance. No matter how bad you might screw it up, you're okay because your performance doesn't count. Why? Because you have been adopted by God. Amen. That's what counts. Your adoption. You're his child. I came to understand the spirit of adoption even more personally when Sandy and I adopted our daughter Angela. And we went through the whole adoption process and all that. When I got her home, and by the way, I've seen these little stickers in cars and bumper stickers that says, baby on board. You don't want to ever mess with them. Because whoever's in there will kill you okay, if you mess with their kid. Okay. And I understood completely what they felt when I drove my daughter home. I was yelling at drivers way up there. Anyhow, when I got her home, I decided I'll spend the first night up with her. She had her days and nights mixed up coming from Korea. And I let my wife go to bed. She said, you get some rest. I'll, sp I'll stay up with her. And I did. The first night. <laughs> After that, it was her mama's job. Okay. <laughs> first night, I stayed up with her. And I remember walking around with this little 12-pound kid in my arm. And I'm walking around the house. And the thing that I wanted more than anything else was to be able to talk to her. Now, understand, she was born in Korea and came over here at six months old and only been exposed to the Korean language. Plus, she was only six months old, so there's no way I could talk to her. I couldn't communicate at all with her. I wanted to. That was in my heart. It was an all-consuming urge to talk to this kid. I wanted to tell her what we'd done for her, what I was going to do for her. Now, just because she didn't 
understand English didn't stop me from talking. I had to do something while I was carrying around. And I'd tell her, you know, this is your house, this is your bed, this is your dogs, this is your truck out there, and this is, and I'd walk around talking to her. She didn't understand anything I was saying. Nothing. But I was talking to her. So that's the way your Heavenly Father is with you. He knows you ain't listening. He knows you ain't paying attention. He knows you don't understand anything he's saying, but he's still talking to you. You know why? Because you're his adopted child. He's still talking to you. And when you screw up, he's not mad at you. He's not condemning you. I remember one of the most exciting things that happened that first night while I was walking around is I looked at her and her, I happened to catch her face and it was beet red. <laughs> I thought, oh my God, she stopped breathing. And she shook a little bit, it was beet red, and then she relaxed. And I went, Oh, I know what she did. <laughs> and I thought that was cute. <laughs> Listen, when you mess your drawers with God, he thinks it's cute. He's not condemning you because he knows who you are. You're his adopted child. He's talking to you, whether you can understand it or not. He's continuing to talk to you. Why? Because you've not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Daddy. See, unless you have this relationship with God as your father, you'll never understand him. And you'll always be afraid of him. We cry, Daddy. Now, here's the last thing I want to leave you with. And that's what God wants to talk to you about. See, I knew there was a catch. God's was trying to straighten me up, I know. You're going to tell me about all the stuff I've screwed up. You're going to tell me all the stuff I should be doing, but I'm not. You're going to tell me all the things that I shouldn't be doing that I am. No, he tells you right here in verse 16 what the Spirit wants to talk to you about. Continuously. His Spirit, that's the Spirit of God, that's the same one that lives in you, that's the Comforter Jesus promised. His Spirit bears witness, gives testimony, declares in no uncertain terms to your spirit, that brand new person God has made you to be, that you are the child of God. He wants to talk to you about who you are. Now don't just blow that off and say, okay, what do you want me to do? <laughs> if you blow that off, you'll never hear what he wants you to do. You can't, because that's not what he's talking to you about. He ain't talking to you about what he wants you to do. Remember, your job is not to do. Your job is to believe. So he's giving you something that you need to believe in. He's giving you your identity. He's talking to you about who he's made you to be. His child. His beloved child in whom he's well pleased. See, until you receive that, again, it's by faith. You've got to believe that he's telling you that. Until you receive that you are his beloved child in whom he is well pleased, you can't do anything but screw up. Mess your diapers. That's all you can do. That's why his spirit is continually bearing witness with your spirit about who you are. The first question that comes to your mind in any situation that you're facing should never be, what shall I do? It should always be, who am I? Who has God made me to be? Once you hear that, what you are to do will follow naturally. Let's close in prayer.
Father God, as we come into your presence, I thank you. I thank you that you've adopted us into your family, that you've given us your spirit to comfort us, to guide us, to teach us, to direct us, to lead us into all truth, to empower us. I ask, Father, that even though we don't understand all there is to know, even though we're confused most of the time, that by your Spirit you would open our hearts and our minds to the truth of who you've made us to be. Calm us down enough to hear you tell us we're okay. For these things I pray in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Appreciate you all being here today. Happy Father's Day, fathers. Have a good afternoon. We'll see you all next week. <laughs>